we may ask, what is the objective? What is the final vision that these people have, the occupiers have? What is it that they want out of this war? And they have four objectives. It is all aimed at ultimately establishing the destroying Masjid al-Aqsa, destroying the, the surroundings around Masjid al-Aqsa, and to build the Temple of Solomon. The preservation of Masjid al-Aqsa, the defense of Masjid al-Aqsa is not a Palestinian issue. Do not fall prey to the terminology, the words that are used by the media. For example, firstly, whenever the, the media talks about this, they talk about a response to what happened on the 7th of October. Yusuf Katir just wanted to introduce Maulana before the announcement. As a Maulana Yusuf Katir from South Africa, he's the Secretary General for the UKSA or United Ulama Council of South Africa, a very esteemed and senior personality. Unfortunately, we do not have time to spend with him. He's just visiting his son who is in Wellington and he had a day with us. So uh, I requested Moana to come and he accepted our request. So we are fortunate that we could spend just a few minutes with him, with a very senior personality back in South Africa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take him back with safety and afia and grant us the ability to take benefit from his likes, inshallah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him for reminding us the importance and the reason for, for why we are fighting the cause of in Gaza and in Palestine. So, Respected mothers, sisters, brothers, and elders in Islam. We have now entered the 97th day of the genocide in Palestine. This genocide has claimed the life of approximately 23,000 people, two thirds of which are women, the children, the aged, and the sick. Over 90% of the people in Gaza are now displaced. They have no place that they can call home because their homes are destroyed. The entire region has been now described as uninhabitable. It's not a place where human beings can live. And the blockade has increased the poverty, levels of poverty, hardship, sickness, and disease in this very small piece of land. We may ask, what is the objective? What is the final vision that these people have, the occupiers have? What is it that they want out of this war? And they have four objectives. The first objective is to cleanse the entire Abdul Muqaddasa, not only Gaza, but the West Bank and the occupied territories. It is to ethnically cleanse it of the Palestinians. The second objective is to redraw the map of Israel, what they call the Greater Israel, that includes the West Bank, that includes Gaza, that includes part of Jordan, part of Lebanon. So the second objective is actually, first objective is get rid of these people. 
The second objective is redraw the map to what is called the Greater Islam. The third objective is to build a canal via Gaza as an alternative to this uh, alternate to the Swiss Canal that will connect Europe to Asia. So they need a passageway, and Gaza is in the way. As long as Gaza is not controlled by them, they do not have the opportunity to create an alternate passageway. It is called currently or envisaged as the Ben Gurion Canal. And the fourth and critically most important objective of this entire genocide, this war, this conflict, is to ultimately destroy Masjid al-Aqsa and build the Temple of Solomon. These are the four objectives of this entire genocide. It is all aimed at ultimately establishing the destroying Masjid al-Aqsa, destroying the, the surroundings around Masjid al-Aqsa, and to build the Temple of Solomon. That's the ultimate. We may ask that if this is such a powerful army that can carpet bomb the entire Gaza area, what prevents them? What is it that prevents them from directly going and destroying Masjid al Aqsa and building the temple? What stops them from doing that? There are several factors, but one factor. Well, I'll, I'll just focus on two factors. The one is that their fiqh, their theology, states that the temple cannot be built until the Messiah, promised Messiah, appears. And the promised Messiah will not appear until the structure that stands there currently, that is the masjid, will cave in, must be destroyed naturally. So they're not permitted to go and carpet bomb the masjid, to destroy the masjid. They have to wait till it actually caves in naturally. Hence you find the excavation under the, uh, uh, well, the foundations of the masjid in the hope that the excavations under the foundations will weaken the structure and the structure will eventually collapse and that will ensure the appearance of the promised Messiah. So this is what they call forcing the hand of God. So what they're doing is that they're excavating under the masjid in the hope that it will collapse and then the uh, promised Messiah will have no alternative but to appear. So that's the first impediment. That's the first thing that prevents them. The second thing is part of the fifth is that the people who build the Temple of Solomon need to be purified to a particular, particular ritual. That ritual requires the appearance of what is called the red haifa, the red cow. And that red cow must be without any blemish. There are certain characteristics of that cow. And as long as that cow does not appear, uh, that cow has to be slaughtered and the bones burnt, made into ash, uh, a paste is made and that paste is used to purify those that will build the Temple of Solomon and uh, so they're waiting for the red appearance of the red haifa or the red cow before they can actually think about going ahead with their plans. These are two impediments that have till now prevented them from going and simply destroying the masjid and going ahead with the designs or the objectives. Now how does all of this impact on us sitting here so far away? Firstly, we must understand that this is not a Palestinian issue. The preservation of Masjid al-Aqsa, the defense of Masjid al-Aqsa is not a Palestinian issue. 
It is the responsibility of the entire Ummah. It's a Muslim issue. If, you know, the first masjid was built in Makkah. Nabi Sallallahu said after a span of 40 years, the second masjid was called, that is Masjid Al-Aqsa. The three masjids, Masjid Al-Nabawi, Masjid Al-Aqsa and the Haram, attack on any one of them is tantamount to an attack on all three of them. What would happen if Ayyad Billah, if Medina is colonized tomorrow and people are prevented from entering Medina and people are butchered in Medina, what would the response of the Ummah be? The same obligation rests with the Ummah when it comes to Masjid al -Aqsa. So it is not a Palestinian issue. It is a response collective responsibility of the entire Ummah. That is why one of these scholars says that Nuharab li annana muslimun wa la nuharib li annana muslimun. The tragedy, the irony is that we are fought against, we are occupied, we are butchered and we are killed purely because we're Muslim. But the tragedy is la nuharib li annana. We do not respond as Muslims. We've relegated the issue to the Palestinian issue and not as a collective responsibility of the Ummah. Now what is it that informs their inhumanity? Why is why would people bulldoze hospitals, break down masjids, uh, destroy schools, kill babies? What is it in the DNA, what is it in the psyche of these Zionists that allows them to do this? In the verse that I recited before you, Allah says, There are people from the Ahlul Kitab, that means the Jews and Christians, that are so upright, that are paragons of virtue and justice, that if you entrust a Qintar, a, a mountain, a, a treasure of gold to them, you abdihi ilayk. They would give it back to you when you ask for it without any reservation. So they are good people amongst the Ahlul Kitab. But then Allah refers to a second class of people. And that actually fits the description of what we know today as Zionists. Allah says, وَمِنْهُمْ And from among them, from among the Ahlul Kitab, if you entrust a single coin to them, compare the, the first part where an entire treasure is entrusted to them and they will return it to you. And here you have a second group in class of people. If you entrust a single dinar to them, they would not Returning to you, illa madunta alayhi qa'ima, except if you stand demanding your rights. They would not give it to you voluntarily. Why? Because there is, as a particular psyche, there is particular thinking when it comes to the Palestinians in particular and the Arabs in general. <laughs> what is that thinking? That is because they say we have no responsibility regarding these unlatted folks, referring to the Arabs. In other words, we regard them as subhuman. We regard them as people who do not deserve to be treated with justice. We regard these people as people who do not enjoy the kind of law that we ask for ourselves. So the entire psyche is couched, is based on this outlook that these are subhumans. They have no human rights. We don't have to treat them with justice. And there's a history behind that which we don't have time to go in. So, when it comes to our response to this genocide, the first thing we need to do is liberate our own minds. Liberate, free your own thinking. 
and you liberate your thinking by the use of correct terminology. Do not fall prey to the terminology, the words that are used by the media. For example, firstly, whenever the, the media talks about this, they talk about a response to what happened on the 7th of October. The timeline for the media is 7th October 2023. What they want to do is they want to erase the 16 years of blockade around the facade. They want you to forget that there's 75 years of occupation. And the minute you use the 7th of October as the timeline, it justifies the right to defend, the right to defend themselves. So this, the timeline did not begin on 2nd, 7th October. The timeline is 75 years old. There's a context to what has happened on the 7th of October. So we should be referring to what we see as a resistance to the illegal occupation of, a of land. And if you use that terminology, resistance, to the illegal occupation of land, the question of defending, uh, the right to defend yourself doesn't apply. Because you can't, the, the thief can't say I have a right to defend what I stole. That terminology, that, the use of that terminology subliminally, without us realizing it, actually controls the narrative in our minds. How we view this whole thing. So it is, not simply a war, it is a resistance to an illegal occupation. And that is critical for us. First, the timeline, it's not 7th October. First, secondly, it is a resistance to Ill, an illegal occupation. Thirdly, if you see the media, when they refer to people, the Israelis, then they say an X amount are killed. So the word killed is used. When they re refer to the casualties among the Palestinians, they say an X amount have died. Almost sanitizing the violence through the use of terminology, through the use of the word died. When they talk of those that were taken from the Israeli side, they talk of hostages. Almost implying these were innocent people caught in crossfire. When they talk about uh, prisoners on the other side, on the Palestinian side, they talk of prisoners of war. This is the terminology. And this is de determines how we think. This de actually determines the narrative of what is happening. So, my time is up, unfortunately. But there are some very pertinent lessons for us from what we see around. Firstly, we learn from the people of Qassa the power of faith, of Iman. That no matter how dying their circumstances are, they have not lost hope, they have not lost faith in their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, what is happening there should be used to deal with our own difficulties and hardships. If we measure our challenges, our difficulties, our hardships against what is happening there, they become very minuscule, very small. So it gives us the ability to respond appropriately to the challenges when we view our challenges, our difficulties, our hardships against the backdrop of what is happening in Gaza. So the famous saying that if you change the way you look at things, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. The things you look at change. If you look at your responsibilities, your hardships, your challenges within the what is happening in Gaza, you will approach your challenges with a positive mind, with appreciation that is not as bad as what is happening elsewhere. So it, should, it ought to teach us the lessons of gratitude the lessons of faith, the lessons of summer. We have not seen people with such resilience in the last century. 
That is what Gaza is teaching us. Resilience, sabr, faith, humility, uni unity. Those are the lessons that are coming out from Gaza. And that is what we need to be taking lessons from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq to respond and learn lessons from what is happening in Qassa. It is an ibrah, it is a test for them, but it is a test for us also. And how are we faring in this trust? What are the levels of extravagance in our lives? What is the level of our faith and commitment and dedication to the deen? I'll leave you with one question. We should all be asking ourselves. Are we Muslims by chance? Or are we Muslims by choice? Are we Muslim by chance because our fathers were Muslims and our grandfathers and we came from a Muslim uh, family and that is why we are Muslim? Or are we Muslims by choice? Do we see the beauty of Islam? Do we appreciate the value system of Islam? And that is what keeps us and sustains our faith. Wa